gotta, we gotta do this quick. We gotta do this quick. Uh, Billy, uh, Chris, uh, not showing up late. Jared, Chris will be. Um, Chris will be. Jared will be late. Chris may not show up. I'm saying they're both thirty minutes late, but they also both ask for the link again. I thought we were starting at ten. We're supposed to. Oh, okay. Oh. We are. Oh yeah, that's what that's why we're saying. Okay, oh, so oh. Jared and Chris are already late. I'm saying they're going to be I 30 see. minutes late. Both, I see. But I'm going to get a message about where's the link ag like uh, again. I didn't, see, I didn't see it. Oh my oh, lord! Oh. Here we go. Oh. All right, so I'm up. I'm up right now. No, I'm up right now. I'm up and I'm ready for the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> we were we were betting you wouldn't show up, but now it's yeah, up to Jared. I knew motherfuckers were taking bets, so I had to set that shit down. <laughs> I, I was in the shower, like, like, why do I feel my balls tickling right now? It's because people are talking shit. It's the Moretto sense. <laughs> shit. It's, it's the spider sense. <laughs> For the re for the record for the record I said you guys would be you would both show but you'd be late and both ask for the link again. So why are we, why are we the old men of the group? Because you actually are. Oh shit! Has it actually become that point? Damn. Well, every fucking post I see on Instagram, it's just, uh, every music post, it's just like, oh, there's Jacob. Oh, there's Jacob. Oh, Jacob's on this. Every band ever. Fucking yeah. everywhere, dude. Fucking boy is working. <laughs> I'm trying, man. I, I did. I, I usually get like offers to do stuff. Um, and a lot of them don't really fall like follow through But this summer kind of just like with clinics and like session trips and that stuff and stuff like that. Everything kind of, everyone was like, Hey, this is still happening. So I, uh, I was kind of all over the place this summer. And then I, I went to, um, San Francisco to shoot some videos for neural DSP and that band, uh, portraits, you know, like, uh, do you know that band? Uh, it's like Joseph Anajar and Josh De La Victoria. They're a bunch of like prog I know freaks. Because of you. Oh yeah, 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 kinda, yeah, kinda kinda, yeah, basically. So yeah, it was like yeah. I've been this summer's been crazy, but that's, I'm glad. I'm glad it's me and not just my plugin. It's good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, dude, it's great to meet you. By the way, dude, we we actually haven't met. I before. actually stayed oh, at wow. your house, bro. Wow. I actually stayed at your house with Painted in Exile one night, and I met you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> My bad, dude. I didn't even realize that you were playing with that. Uh, That's yeah. awesome. No, it's all good. <laughs> but yeah, it is. Wait, so when would that have been? Uh, dude, it was on our the Scar Symmetry tour, so it was like it must have been like 2015 or 16. I it was a long time ago, bro. Don't worry about it. Scar Symmetry tour. Yeah. Wait. So were you playing in Baltimore? I think yeah. I think we played in Baltimore and we crashed at your. What? Yeah, we crashed at your house. Um, a bunch of the guys crashed in your basement. I said, "What's up to you?" For it's fine. I literally said, "Up to you." What's up to you for like one second? And I, me and my keyboardist slept in the van. But uh, yeah, that's amazing. Uh, it's all good. It's all. Okay. I mean, yeah, we've played on enough session work together that it's like we're we. I know. We've, yeah, that's so we, funny. Yeah, we're, we're homies. It's all good. Yeah. Yeah, really sorry about that, dude. I didn't even realize. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it makes sense that you were sleeping in the van, but uh, yeah, dude. Uh, because I totally, I do have a memory of Painted in Exile in my basement, yeah. hanging out like super late. Yeah. But yeah, for some reason, I didn't remember you being there. Okay. Dude, I, anyway, I, I recommend you all the time for when people are hiring out and they're like, yeah, I played this riff. You know, can you recommend somebody? <laughs> it's like, yeah, that dude. Jacob, are you so, playing yeah. any jazz? Are you playing any, any jazz these days? Uh, or is it all rock metal? Yeah. I mean, I... I might throw, maybe I'll throw a jazz curveball. Yeah, at you dude, please. I, I, I mean, I, I study, I, I, st I studied enough of it, but it's just, it just comes in handy when like, you know, the music that's, you know, the music I play, which is like, you know, your stuff or a lot of the, you know, crazy stuff. It's all influenced by that. So if someone gives me changes, I can write bass lines over it that kind of highlight those changes rather than just playing yeah. roots, which is nice. But uh, yeah, no one's really like throwing like inner urge my way. You know oh, what well. I mean? Oh, that's a good one. Yeah, we should do that. Sweet. So here we are with almost everyone in, <laughs> almost everyone in Everport. You know, I'm not even gonna message. Uh... Look, Jared, I know you're listening to this right now because him and the four twelve p.m. doesn't work. So you know. Yeah, he does. Yeah, this doesn't. That, this he, he's prior. got a late pass. This we know not... that. We know. The... You know. Yeah. All right. He's got a late pass and a. So he's he's ex he's excused, but maybe we'll get maybe. Jared on here at some at some point today. Don't roll it. 
Um, so how did we all meet each other? That is the, the, internet. the first mm. question. And I'm going to time box this. I'm going to time box this to 10 minutes. <laughs> so here's, so who wants to go? Oh, wait, Chris, Chris, I'm sorry, guys. Just, just, just give me one second. Yeah, don't you start ready? with me. <laughs> Oh, oh, whose idea was to do this shit at 10 a.m.? Yeah. <laughs> ah, oh, yeah. I think you made this cover. I may have you? way back in 2007 or six, but I think so. Me and Nick met through um, somebody we both knew, and we started a band. And I was well, basically, I said, Have you ever heard of Dragon Force? It's so fucking crazy, like all this shredding and shit. And Nick just goes, Absolutely not. I can do that. And then so we <laughs> went to like I had a studio in in like Massapequa in New York, and Nick just started like shredding over shit. And then we were, and Nick was like, let's just make this into a band. And so we did. And then I think from there, basically, you know, we got your brother who was playing bass, uh, Jared who was going to purchase at the same time. So it was Kevin, right? And then I think yeah. from there it was finding Chris, right? In which I put out a post on MySpace. Yeah. And oh no no on Craigslist and the Craigslist ad said we're looking for somebody who sounds like Chris Barreto and then Chris's friend Brendan actually wrote back to that thing and he said I think I have the right person for you and then he he found Chris who was in uh, California at the same time <clears throat> but that's just like the very first thing and so we put out that that one you were just holding that was an album we put out in 2007 <laughs> right and it was just like shred kind of like metal it was just it was just wild and you were it's screaming on it with a guy named James Beach um yeah it might be like i don't know if it's like even any fun to listen to because no, the fun. vocals are so no, 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 it's fun i've listened to I it recently you guys fun? Are i don't know lorna shore way ahead before lorna shore was actually lorna shoring i'm just saying i, I think so i, I still so have maybe we should I like find it, it i was listening to it, it like a day or yeah. two ago and i was like holy shit this is like actually what's what's popping Let's let's put it on let's put it on Spotify. It's no, a whole was, bunch of shit that no one's ever. I was really gonna say, where yeah. can we hear this? Uh, I'll drop. I, I can I can Dropbox it to you. Yeah, it's, it's there. I have it all. Uh, collected. I mean, I feel like. It but yeah, and so that's kind of. Oh, sorry, the talking world. Go for it. No, no, I was just gonna say. I feel like Go if you actually took some of that stuff, like re-recorded it, and like just thrown it in the modern mix, man. There's a lot of shit in there that you guys were doing that were was actually pretty ahead of the time. Yeah, so there's that one song I sent you recently, Chris. Like that was actually a song that we redid from those times. Remember I, that one? I, I forgot the I name of it. It was very Meshuggah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It was a modernized version of it, and it was really it did cool. Sound great, man. I really mean it. It really sounded like something that you might hear today. And just like the, I think probably the most obvious thing with things like that is that like you can hear the sort of like time of things, like because the vocals, in particular, since they like stand out just the most in some ways, but like. You know, like, it's it's a much, it's just an older idiom of sort of, like, vocalizing over that kind of stuff. Like, the modern stylization, like, especially with, like, the new cats and whatever. Like, you know, it'd probably be a bit more extreme, but, like, whatever. It's The music stands within the, the context of it all, in my opinion. For sure. Yeah, so so we, uh, we all kind of, we all met. Um, we had a, I think we had a bunch of songs already written prior to Chris joining. Uh, and then we probably maybe half of the album, half of this album we had written before Chris joined. And then uh, this is unopened, by the way. It's like the last one in this existence. This is probably the only unopened. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah, probably the... the wow. People still email me looking for it. And I have the original sample that, that uh, CD Baby sent in yeah. the jewel oh, case. Oh, shit. History. Clark design. That was like the... Uh... Yeah. And this is the only version in a jewel oh, case. Geez. Yeah, that's pretty cool. cool. And sure. uh, yeah, we pretty much did all this, tracked everything from our our homes, my parents' basement, Billy's apartment. Chris would just sleep over <laughs> at my house and just track vocals in the corner of the bedroom. You ate those edible just, brownies <laughs> like they were regular brownies. I mean, <laughs> that tracks. So when did the uh, did the uh, Chris when you first heard the 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 music for the first time was there already elements of jazz in yeah. it or did we kind of start doing that yeah. once um it yeah. was uh, the first song you had was called uh it was latencies and tendencies right and that's what already had the jazz section that was very it evolved over time but that was the first one i think yeah I, I, i'm pretty or sure was it or was it actually i'm pretty sure it was latency no no i'm pretty one. sure it was latency yeah. and tendencies yeah. uh, i also want to say dispose of your optimism may have been in there but um 
I mean, the thing that like, so I like, like you were saying, I was in California at the time and um, my buddy at Brandon at the time was the one who found you guys. And, um, you know, I kind of had like a bunch of people for lack of a way of putting, uh, lack of a better way of putting it back in New York while I was out in LA. And um, they sent me that, I think, I, I want to say they sent me more than one, but I mean, the, that one stands out just because, like, that one had, I mean, it just encompassed all of this, what you could just sort of say is the ever forthright thing. So, like, you know, it touched on, obviously, like, the language of the time, which was, like, you know, for, just going to say it fucking, you know, genty, whatever kind of shit, just so everybody understands what we're talking about, but, like... You know, but beyond the sort of groovy riffing and I mean, you know, like technical guitar stuff, you know, the melodic aspect, like everything harmonically moved nicely, you know, it gets to the bridge and like there's soloing happening, except it's not some jive ass fucking, you know, soloing. It's like some real fucking soloing. And like immediately my ears just get sucked in and drawn in and like. I, it was just a different experience from everything I, I had had at that time. And, and I, I should just try to kind of preface, you know, like I've, I've had a very unique life in the sense that, you know, I grew up with a, a jazz musician, you know, so I had a very specific kind of upbringing and training. Um, my mother, whilst not a musician herself, you know, was an artist of sorts, you know, she was like a ballet dancer and everything. So I had like this whole like artistic experience and everything that was very much a focus of my life. And so for a long time, you know, like I kind of felt like, you know, I have this sort of, like, snobby elitist thing because, like, I'd just been raised by Ray Barretto who had just, like, told me, be like, actually, this is, like, you know, what good stuff sounds like and whatever, you know. So trying to find this world of language within metal, which is so raw and so passionate and so just, like, a lot just, like, for lack of a way we're putting, a lack of blah, 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 better way of putting it from, like, the soul. But, um, I mean, I feel like that shares a lot of idioms with, with I mean, certainly jazz, which is something that we all grew up with. But, like, you know, just a lot of just, like, music in general that its roots come from this just, like, place of, like, this urgency and this need for expression. So, I mean, all of that to say, literally, when it gets to the bridge and Nick comes in and starts playing, and then when Kevin starts playing, I mean, it was literally those two components that just changed my world. So much so that I immediately was like, okay, I got to get on a plane and go back to New York. Because, like, the music, the music was calling. That's you know? nuts. And, and that's it. Let me... I want to I want to pop, pop over to Jacob and Mike for a sec because you guys were I when did you, did you you guys were fans Got of Ever Fourth right um at some point <laughs> never <right? laughs> never <laughs> um no nah, dude I you guys were like um so that record came out um when I was in high school and I remember um hearing that and just being like Cause it was, it was around when I was about to graduate and figure out what I wanted to do. I knew I wanted to do music. And it was like one of the first instances where I heard like, Oh, these guys are just a bunch of like jazz dorks that are in a metal band. That's like kind of exactly what I want to do. And, um, it was super inspiring. And I just remember, um, it was around like when, you know, like the gent thing. So like volumes, periphery, ever forthright, all those bands were kind of popping off at, yeah, yeah. like, you know, before they all really blew up. <laughs> And um, I remember before I heard you guys, I remember seeing a comment um, on like a periphery video and saying like, hey, if you like periphery, you should listen to Ever Forthright. They have this song called Spineless that makes Icarus Lives sound like Ender Sandman. <laughs> and it was like the fun, it was, like the <laughs> funniest thing. I, and so I immediately checked you guys out. But yeah, I was a, I was a big fan. Um, I remember seeing like listening to like the little Albert experiment and being like, okay, like these guys are making 13 sound heavy and then um and then <laughs> and then uh, what was the other one like lost in our escape was was the like the paint yeah, video yeah. right yeah i remember seeing that yeah, yeah so yeah. yeah i i definitely you know knew of you guys and i was i was definitely digging what you guys were doing back then so yeah Dalton, yeah did you know about us mike yeah and i'm racking my brain trying to remember exactly how i first heard about you <laughs> Uh, cause I remember Al <laughs> Moomin from Heart Machine was really, really into you guys. And so I just like have wow. this very distinct memory of being 
in London and Al just being like, mate, <laughs> have you heard of these guys? <laughs> and, uh, and I want to say that yeah, I did. I want to say that I'd already heard the, the 2011 record and stuff. Cause like, um, you know, I knew the periphery guys from, you know, just like the local sort of Maryland, I mean, DC, Northern Virginia met, so. scene. Yeah. I, I, yeah, right? yeah. Isn't it? And, and uh, it was at a periphery yeah, show. Wasn't I mean, it? Um, I mean uh, maybe my like local band was playing with you guys I, or something. I, I mean, want to guess... say I either met you at like a practice, but that may have been like that other local band. There was, okay. So back in those, just real quick, like the, they were, you were within ruins, right? That was the name of your band. It's, it was, very close. Rest among ruins. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's a that's no, another. No, but within the ruins is sick. Uh, <laughs> yeah, within the totally ruins is sick. Uh, I remember the ruins part, but um, there was some other band, yeah. and there was like just like this local network, and everybody was just friends and everything, and so it was either yeah. at a show or a rehearsal or some shit like that. So yeah, yeah. But <laughs> I had known, uh, you know, um, the periphery guys when um, I guess Travis was still in the band. And Casey was still in the band. Um, God, who was there? Oh yeah, yeah, Travis and uh, the the old bassist Tom. Uh, what was his? And Alex, Alex and yeah. Tom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and yeah, yeah. I remember meeting Casey and like just like once or twice or something. Mm -hmm. And then there were no vocals. And actually, this is kind of funny. Uh, I was playing in a band called Samadhi at the time, and it was like a total soil work knockoff. Uh, it was like produced by Peter Witchers, the the soil work guitar player, and uh, and and the, every every song ended up sounding like something off like Natural Born Chaos or like Stabbing the Drummer or something. It's kind of funny, but it was an awesome record. Anyway, we did like a little self book tour and everything, and meanwhile, Periphery. Uh, as an instrumental band was touring, dude, in in like a uh, like a Winnebago or some shit. <laughs> it was Travis's mom's um, like camper, traveling oh, camper. There you go. Yes, and and I remember, but right before that tour, like I I had auditioned for them uh, for Periphery, and um, but I was just about to leave for this like this Samadhi quote unquote tour uh, of, you know, however many, I don't know, four crappy dates. And, uh, and I remember Misha saying like, dude, like we're going to link up at some point. You want to just come on stage and just improvise. <laughs> and I was like, improvise. <laughs> 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 and then, uh, and then here I am, you know, a decade later playing with like, I'd say some of the sickest improvisers over here. I still to this day cannot improvise. So uh, yeah, I never actually learned my lesson. Shabadoo wop, shabadoo wop, pop, pop, scuba doo bop. See, you know that's yeah, yeah. That, that's cool. you could have helped me. Teach me. Uh, okay, let's get into uh, anyway. musical evolution a little bit, like because uh, I'm assuming if anyone is watching this. Um, or if, 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 if you are, if you are watching this, you are familiar at least with the, uh, with the existing ever fourth rate album, 2011. Is that right? It was the 2010, 2011, right? Spotify says 2011. So that's gotta be right. It was all written before yeah, 2011, okay. so, but yeah. So, so at the moment, this is <laughs> at the moment, this group are, is it's pretty much the only people familiar with, with the new, with the new, uh, music, yeah. um, how has the new stuff changed over the years? How are these songs different from from those uh, first batch of songs over a decade ago? I mean, who wants this? I one? mean, I can just start by saying I think that most of that first album was me and you just in a room for like years, going like, "What is this going to sound like?" and just kind of poking at things and making kind of like a shell of every single song, and then kind of like you know, Kevin would come along and put his like thing on top of that. And then Chris would come and put his thing on top of that. But I think this new one was maybe like a little bit more, I guess, collaborative in a sense. Like, right. There was a few writers for it. Like Chris wrote on some of it. Mike wrote on some of it. Jared wrote all and performed all the drums. Right. Jacob wrote and performed all the stuff where you played most of the bass on the, the next one. So I, I feel like it, it definitely is. It definitely did take a different turn. Right. There was more people involved in it than, you know, 70% me and you and then other people coming along. But Definitely a little bit more easy, yeah. 
here, here's one evolution. The songs are actually possible to play. So that's kind of nice. He struggled to play the first album on stage. I don't know if, if, if you remember or if anybody watching this remembers when we performed um, Riot in uh, Pennsylvania. <laughs> he just fucking ruined it. I hope you got nobody fucking remembers that, 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 that performance. My, and my, my, bass uh, room, was like seven. my bass room trigger wasn't working. And they forgot nothing to like it, so that was funny. They only nothing. Oh my god! Working. So that's so we missed all the cues yeah. and everything. Yeah. Well, another thing of that's that's funny about the first record is you know when I joined the group, <clears throat> it was never like an official joining. I kind of like, I don't know. We were playing Meshuga covers just for fun. Uh, uh, for fun. Yeah, and it was just like <laughs> yeah, because I was uh, we met in jazz school at Purchase, and we were playing in Ted Pilsaker's band. Remember that? Yeah. And yeah, and we're just like, okay, let's uh just for fun. You know, the music was kind of mellow, so we're like, let's play some Mashuga shit just for fun. And then uh, I think after well, a while you uh, brought in uh latency and tendencies. That was the first song that I heard of the from the first record. But the I didn't really know how to play metal at the time. So like I was a jazz drummer 100%, so I was kind of learning as I went. But then you started sending me all this impossible shit to play. Like, okay, here, here's Spineless. I'm like, I can't play this. I, like, <laughs> I, 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 I'm using the same double bass pedal I played in high school, and it barely works. So like, yeah, you'll figure it out. Hmm. And then you send, like, Dispose Your Optimism. I'm like, I, I don't know if I can play this shit. And like, yeah, you, you'll be cool. Yeah. <laughs> you figured it so out. That, that's kind of how it worked. But, the, yeah, I was like, yeah, I, I don't um, think... Uh, on the first record, I don't think it was like, okay, yeah, we're going to have to actually play this together at some point on a stage. I don't think that was like really the idea behind it. No, definitely. Yeah. It's like, let's write this yeah, impossible definitely not. shit. There's definitely more of a, there's definitely more of a, like, let's write a, a, a cohesive song that will, um, it'll, it'll sit better when it comes time to mix it. Like we can, like, I'm pretty sure mixing the first album was a total nightmare because there was about eight was zillion nice synth tracks going and, on at and any guitar time, tracks, and, mostly right, and and vocal and guitar track tracks. Oh. And there was no editing on that yeah, record. There was, it was no, just there like, was no editing oh, this time. Yeah, this, this time we 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 went. In, this time we went into it with much more of a. You know what? Like the most important part here is going to be the bass. So we don't need 18 other instruments happening here. The most important part here is going to be the drums. We don't need 18 other instruments happening here. So you know, there, sure. there's that. Um, also, it's it's you know, ten years later, it's also kind of interesting to look on something like Spotify and Apple Music and see something like Lost in Our Escape having five times as many listens as like All Eyes on the Earth. The you know, um, yeah. you know what I mean? Or like Dispose of Your Optimism, not even a top five song. It's it's in, it's in, it's just it's interesting because those are like to me that's like those are the jams like Dispose, Screen Scenarios, Little Albert Experiment. But what the audience kind of is really listening to is Lost in Our Escape, All Eyes on the Earth, the easy ones, the ones yeah. with like the the vocal hooks, the the easy ones, yeah. The, those yeah. songs came later. We we're talking about Evolution, and um, the Fuck funny thing about the first record is that was that was a long period. That was like two two or three years that took to get all the songs together. So the crazy techier stuff was actually the earliest songs of the of the batch. So, um, and then later on they. Uh, they got uh, crazier, or they got simpler. So, like, uh, I think Lost yeah, Our Escape was later. I was talking uh, to Nick uh, about about this uh, about this album, and and Nick, one thing you had said is that you guys were uh, mindful about your writing uh, writing for a vocalist when the original 2011 album, uh, you didn't necessarily keep all of those things in mind. Um, how was how was it different writing that way than? writing back in 2011 i just think it was mostly that right it was mostly us being like okay oh, can, yeah. can, can yeah, vocalists yeah, actually yeah. sing over this or like you know like can can they make something like there's got to be like yeah. a simple part where they can make something over it. i think i think it's just simply like that that's that's just how we thought about when we sat down to kind of come up with the concept yeah yeah it's trying to keep in mind like creating a sense of um creating a sense of vibe like you know if you loop something for 16 bars chances are it's not really in like enough you know if the if the audience is there just starting to settle into a, a groove uh after eight bars 16 bars i think on the first album we would have said okay next thing um which is 
which is cool. It's a certain, but it's a it's a type of thing. Um, but uh, on this one, we definitely tried to like create a sense of vibe, something that looped for a, a little bit longer, um, allowed people to enjoy individual sections a bit more before changing changing the topic and going on to something else. So you guys took it easy on me, is what you're saying? I think Except so. I plugs. think I think Chris had a harder. <laughs> I think Chris probably had a harder time figuring out what to do the, well for the first batch of songs. <laughs> it was written, it was written to be instrumental though, basically, right? Because all a lot of that stuff was from two thousand eight nine, right? And where we weren't thinking about that, we were just thinking about how fucking crazy could it be? Yeah, exactly. I was going to say there's that from like an from uh, like an outside perspective, like someone just coming into it knowing like the older material, and then having to you know play on the new stuff. The there's definitely some songs that are a bit more like focused from a songwriting perspective. Like you have songs like. Uh, what's the crazy like Techniflux or like The Well which is kind of closer okay. to the 2011 shit where then you have a song like um, like Marquee or like Marquee or what's the other one that's like duh, 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 duh. Yeah, John, like, yeah exactly so stuff like that where it's like oh cool riff verse chorus riff verse chorus like that's you know that's something that you guys didn't really do too much so that was one I was I was not expecting that I was expect like cause um I think the way I got into this was like Billy just sent me uh like what did you send me? I think you sent me like a section from Rancho and you're like can yeah, you play bass on this cuz like yeah. we what we wrote sucks and I was like sure. And I send it back and I just listened to the <laughs> I listened to like the programmed bass and I was like oh this is kind of rough and I just messed it. I think I just messaged like hey right now. Yeah, I just I was just like, hey, if you guys like if you want to talk to your guys, I'm happy to just do like the whole thing if you if you want. And um I kind of just weaseled my way into the record that way. But yeah, um, and you did it faster <laughs> than anybody else too. So. Jacob, I love the fact that you said Tech and Flux felt like the earlier stuff because it literally is, yeah. It literally is. It's like the yeah, oldest song. Okay. It is. Yeah, exactly. It's, 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 it's actually like one of the older yeah. songs, including the Yeah, first so that was the second one funny. I got. That was the first for, full song that I tracked, and I didn't hear anything else. So when... Uh, when uh, so Billy yeah, wrote no, you in no. with the easy one. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> yeah, and it was funny because well, he sent me... Well, here's the thing. So he sent me that... Um, a rancho, I think, which I only had to do a little bit of. And then he sent me Technoflux. I'm like, oh, great. Nothing's changed. They're still up to their normal bullshit. And then, and then <laughs> he sent me all the easy stuff. And then I tracked the rest of the record. Like, it was pretty seamless. And then the last song he sent me was The Well. And I'm like, oh, okay, cool. So the last song is like this, you know, create, like I, yeah, the last one was definitely the hardest song to track. But um, I think The Well is probably my favorite one. Oh, interesting. So, where does a song like "Kick Fun" sit in your mind in terms of oh, old I have versus to listen new? To that one, because I'm not sure which one that is. Yeah, Give man, me two man. seconds. Yeah, go uh, for it. Kick Fun, Kick Fun. Huh. Oh yeah, oh yeah, that one. Uh, that's probably closer to the older stuff for sure. Because it's just like this. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Because that's also that's that's yeah, also an can, old riff. It's got like little Albert vibes for sure. Um, where it just starts with that you know, never ending synth line that you guys, that we all have to somehow double. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> everyone played yeah, the same time. Yeah, exactly. Um, but yeah, that, that one was tricky too. But, um, yeah, I'd say like the well was definitely the, the cool. trickiest one, but, and then I had to write that crazy bass sweeping thing at the end that we put in like very last minute. But, uh, yeah, I'd say the, yeah, yeah I'd say overall there's a lot of, a lot of the songwriting, for maybe like half the record is a bit more focused and then you give like the old fans what they want with the ridiculous prog stuff but even that it's it's all like like thematically it works like everything sa sounds like that it's called for you know nothing's like the worst thing i think it, you can do is just be proggy for the sake of being proggy which i think is just horrible mm -hmm. but and which you know you guys are a prog band so it's fine but it's not it's not really like tongue in cheek you know what I mean? It's it's actually like musical, and mm -hmm. there's a re there's it's purposeful. Yeah, you guys don't. Uh, suck. I want a sidebar <laughs> question real quick. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, I guess what I'm saying is you guys don't really. Yeah, you guys exactly. don't suck. You're pretty good. Um, a sidebar question, Jared. You had mentioned you never officially joined the band. What is an official? band joining ceremony well like well, funny thing should we, should, should we give you should we give you an official band yeah, joining ceremony we'll still have an official right. joined. i guess we'll let you into the band now 50 years later. <laughs> well, <laughs> well funny thing was is <laughs> you you showed me the original uh ep before i was uh the one that i'm not 
playing on and you're like hey do you want to play this stuff and i kind of i was like i can't play this shit and i kind of like uh i don't know i i, I kind of brush it off i guess and then later on we started doing the Meshuggah covers so i like kind of gradually uh worked my way in because uh, you know if it was just like okay yeah here's these these songs these crazy songs just learn them all and we have a show next week i don't think i you know it had to be more of a, a gradual thing um but uh yeah I, I when you first asked me to play in the band i had i don't think i even owned a double bass pedal at that point yeah i think yeah the first Sweet. one that we actually played together was latencies and then maybe the little albert experiment and we were just kind of jamming on them it wasn't like like hey i have this band you want to play in the band it was just like oh I, you know we play some sugar covers for fun and it's like oh hey i wrote i wrote this song let's let's jam on this one i wrote this one let's jam on that hey we have a we have a singer joining the band we, we have a show it wasn't like uh you know you're in the band now it's no like official initiation but um uh, did, did anybody uh, have one we should uh, <laughs> we, we should we should we should we should think about what an official initiation could could you mean. Get a certificate well, in the mail. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's what happened. That's what happened. Gift card. And I would get a ten dollars on a gift card. Well, 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 well to be fair, that would be more money than I've made in the band in the last ten years. So that's true. We made so, millions. So, millions. Yeah. 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 Fourth right dollar. Bitcoin. Our fucking digital. Yeah, we should Bitcoin. You know what? It would have been cool if I got Bitcoin oh, back then. Because then I'd uh, be a billionaire. Just give You'd me be a one. billionaire. Yeah. Yeah. Funny story about Bitcoin. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. We Chris. can still make that right. Everyone gets everyone gets uh, ten dollars worth of Bitcoin as their band initiation, and we cross our fingers that in another ten years it's worth something. Let's change gears here a bit. Let's see. Um, are there any specific tracks or albums that mark significant turning points in your musical growth? These AI generation questions. You guys are going to laugh, uh, but, and and th this band, actually them and Incubus, 311 and Incubus were the two bands yeah. that actually taught me, like, my jazz chords. <laughs> Uh, and so I was taking guitar lessons as uh, a wee lad, and uh, you know I, I show up with my Stratocaster that I still have back there, actually. And uh, you know my teacher's like, "Oh yeah, this is a major seventh chord. Here we go." You know I'm like learning like Amber or something from 311, and I'm like, "Oh okay, that's cool. That's not a regular, yeah, open chord. Very cool." So that kind of changed things for me, but also. 311 was like the first band that I really listened to where it was like two very distinct singers, you know, who, who had very different tones, who wrote very intentional That's true. harmony. That's true. They had two singers. That's right. And so it's like, right. And so like, knock them all you want. You know, Amber's super cheesy and all that stuff. But like, dude, like those guys were very intentional about yeah. their harmony writing. If you like dig into their old stuff, like... I don't know. I think I'd that they go were back. really good. Uh, that's at, like, a, that's a good yeah, point. yeah. And and it's not there aren't too many artists that have like two singers like equally leveled in a mix where it's like you could sing either one of these. Like I, when I'm like listening to it with someone else, it's like, oh, that dude's singing that high part because he's got a higher voice, I guess. And then I'm singing this part, yeah, no, that makes sense. you know, and so I, I don't know. They, they they changed the game oh, wow. for me at least Man, did, um what was the record that had like all the fire on it, it had the song down on it um oh yeah yeah man, that chaos. record i that was like that was such a big part of my childhood man i remember yeah that that was a good totally. one I, I, that's the one no, with I amber think it doesn't yeah. have I, I think it's before amber oh then <laughs> it's it's either transistor i know every album it, or the self-titled or it's music I, I wish I remember grassroots. which one, but um, no, I was like literally like middle school, yeah. not even no elementary school. I was listening to a ton of that and like rage and everything. But yeah. I could I just but the the, yes, the two um, the two singer thing. You know, I would have I never would have yeah. distinguished that as a younger listener, and so I just find it interesting that that's your experience with right. it because like that's uh that's just a different way to bring it yeah. in. I always would have thought like until I'd literally seen the music video that uh it was just one singer. So that's like. So what? So yeah, those two? Yeah, did yeah. you like distinctly hear those two sounds and be like, "That's cool"? Like, there's two things going on here. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I mean, like that one dude. I mean, they also like used to rap yeah, yeah. like 
quite a bit. I mean. And I so, like, you know, they cool. chime in yeah. with like their names. You know how that's like the rapper thing? Like S.A. Yeah, yeah, Martinez yeah, yeah. checking in, you know, like Nick Hexum checking in. Here we yeah. go. My verse, you know. And so, yeah, like, honestly, I think I, I was first able to tell them apart when they like rapped because of how different yeah, their yeah. speaking voices were. And then I think like my ear just kind of picked up on the harmony and stuff. And so, yeah, that's cool. You were listening yeah, to man. them then as well. And Rage Against RPG, Machine. I come mean, on, come seriously. on. Wait, wait, come which on. Incubus record is Dude. your favorite? I have to ask you. I know, I know what you're gonna say, Chris, because I was just—I've been waiting for a spot to jump in, yeah. and I know the answer. Yeah, yeah. To, I know okay. the—I know the answer right. to this. And oh, I'm gonna yeah, say yeah, it. See. Are you ready? Are you ready? All right, no. Go. No, because um, science. science, science, baby, for sure. <laughs> yeah, cool. Hundred percent, man. Yeah. Oh. Dude, vitamin and fucking anti gravity, fucking the rest of them. <laughs> um, certain shade of green, dude. Summer romance. Yeah, uh, summer that, romance. That whole record. Yeah, that, that whole record is just it? literally ahead of its time. Just it is. Mm-hmm. There's also there's also like a some mean mean shit on there. Yeah, what's that one yeah, song? It, something gla- it, glass. Honestly, mm. it's kind of like everyone, <laughs> in a way. It's just fuck to bring it mm-hmm. all around. Yeah. Um, you know, it all just yeah. kind of connects in a fucking super musical way, and it doesn't even like. I don't know. I must. I, I don't understand. Like, because so many people love make yourself. I just think. There's so much imagination on that record, man. It's so crazy. So maybe yeah, you can so answer funny. this uh, for me, but I remember hearing a rumor as a kid, uh, so like pre-internet, <laughs> that uh, that Incubus used to be a Megadeth cover band or some sort of metal cover band. Is there any truth to that? I never actually looked into it in like the modern internet either, era. <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna that find reminds me out. of Sugar Ray being yeah. a metal band. Do you remember that? Stop, Me- Mark McGrath. Check out uh, this song called "Mean Machine." Wow. Huh. What? I don't know. You anyway, do let's well, pass the ball to well, Jared or somebody. I think. I think <laughs> Incubus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's pass. Let's pass. Well, let's pass, just going. Let's pass the ball. We need some inspiration. Going back to the Incubus thing, I think they were. I thought they were like a. They started as a crazy metal band. Like the name Incubus is like a a demon <laughs> of some sort. Yeah. <laughs> It's like like you like, well, like listen to this. You gotta listen. Um, you, mean a you gotta listen. I don't know. You, you gotta listen to the song "Glass" by Incubus on on the album Science. That sh- it has such it has this mean mean section in it. That's like to me, it's reminiscent of like Tony Danza. It's just like the squealing, um, yeah. with like some double bass pedal. It's so it's so sick, and it's it's like old. it's still their best record for sure. Science. They kind of got more commercial as time went on. I still I, I like their stuff, but. Yeah, the earlier stuff, the better for me. Um, but yeah, in terms of influential records, um, I guess, you know, as a kid, definitely I, I listened, listened to a bunch of Incubus. And like, the it, just in terms of metal, I guess, the, like the first two influential metal bands, really like, you know, there's the Metallicas and the Panteras, Ooh. but like bands that have like a, like a really high level of depth that I heard were obviously Meshuggah. Everybody, you know, everybody knows Meshuggah. But then uh, Candiria, hell, oh, hell yeah, that a lot of hell, people talk but, about. Yeah. You know, like those are the first two bands I heard that, like, okay, metal doesn't have to be this like garage band vibe. You know, it could be, you can really have a level of depth and uh, substance. Not not that the the bands I mentioned before don't, but there's just something those two bands have that was pretty special. And honestly, I didn't really hear a lot of that until. Um, I didn't hear any other bands really have that, uh, element until like 2009, 2010. And then I heard the, like the animals as leaders first, uh, record, the one with the program drums that yep, Mitchell yep. produced. And also the, the first, I remember showing you that. I remember showing you that on, at my house in my uh, parents' kitchen. I remember that. Yeah. That was kind of a turning point and you gave yeah. me a big mp3 cd of all the stuff that you were checking out and that What's was like that? the one thing on <laughs> that just said, oh for the uninitiated <laughs> for the kids yeah it was a, it was a, it was a, it was a thing for like four months yeah it was like oh you can load a cd with like a thousand mp3s that's yeah, cool yeah my car was cool because it actually played <laughs> mp3s just like, yes. like next like four thousand mm-hmm. times like all right what's that song i want <laughs> yeah like 200 songs on a cd but yeah i remember that one on that on that compilation stood out and that kind of led me to periphery which was 
you know, that 2010 uh, first record was in a metal sense. That was that was pretty uh, inspirational. It's like, OK, you like there's this whole new wave of bands coming up that can also have that level of depth. Like it's catchy, but it's also um, it has the nerdy proggy stuff in there. They're well written songs. They're rhythmically complex. Um you know, for years I was asking friends like, oh, what's like the cool metal shit that's happening? And people would mention bands and I would I would check them out and I'd be like, yeah, that's my thing. I, I actually kind of remember those two bands were- back when Periphery came out. I think I downloaded the, the album illegally off the internet and then I sent it to you, Nick, when you were at yeah, Purchase. The and then you like went dark for like a week and then you're like, yo, I've been listening to this album like every day. And you sh- I think you showed it to like Forzano and Jared and stuff like that. Do you remember that? Yeah, yeah, it was a, it was a big, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was a big, it was a big deal. It, like, uh, it, uh, yeah, it was, it was pretty, pretty different at the time. Um, we were already doing something s- similar. We just didn't have our production chops together like at all, and we also didn't know any. Uh, we weren't focused. We didn't know anybody. We were just kind of like, oh, there's other people writing music similar to this. I mean, th- they're similar. We're, we're, we were very different. We, we are very different. Um, but <laughs> boring. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Sorry. All right, Jacob, how about you? But, uh, um, yeah, I'm, I was, I'm curious about Jacob. Like what, what were you listening to? Like what were you shedding and listening to in high school yeah, sure. and like like until all of this stuff popped off? Because this style of bass playing I think is kinda yeah. new. Like I don't remember Dingwall Dingwall basses no, when I was They've been around for a while, but they and, didn't really, you know, like you said, pop off until like late two thousand tens and now. But um I yeah. like started playing bass and I was really into like I was playing like Green Day and stuff like that, but I would always gravitate towards like the heavier stuff, like the bass riff and like Holiday. And then I eventually saw like Avenged Sevenfold on MTV Two or whatever. And um, I my favorite album, like kind of like my Rosebud album, would be like um, City of Evil. That album like changed my <laughs> life by Avenged Sevenfold. Yeah, and um, yeah. and then I was playing that. I was I learned that whole record and their whole thing and. That led me back to like Metallica and Pantera, but um, what like changed my life was Colors by Between the Buried and Me. That that album just completely. The bass playing like, on that is fucking phenomenal. Yeah, Dan Briggs yeah. is like one. He's the he's the homie, yeah. but also he like it was the first time where I, I saw because with Avenged it was like okay cool the bass is like distorted and punchy and present, but now Dan's doing. The jazz thing that my my long yeah dan was doing like the jazz thing that my teacher who i was studying with he was teaching me you know jocko and stuff it was like kind of linking that with the metal stuff and it was the first time where the bass wasn't just doubling the guitar riff he was doing all these contrapuntal lines and like outlining chords while the guitars were you know playing the riff and uh and that kind of led me to the prog world i Dream Theater was cool, but they weren't really super. I wasn't really super into them. But that led me to like, like the Faceless, like Planetary Duality was another huge one for me. Um, and then obviously, like the first Periphery record, um, when I was introduced to that, I was like, okay, cool. This is a lot of this proggy stuff, but it's a little bit more. You know, it's all clean vocal, like a lot of clean vocals, and and yeah this whole the whole gen thing you know when everyone first heard it it was everyone was like super into it including myself um but yeah in terms of like bass players um i was super into oh and uh and then i think probably top three records just of all time would probably be like obzen by mashuga um that one kind of changed a lot for me and then uh yeah destroy your race improve uh, but yeah those are kind of my my top my top records that I think influenced me, not like bass records, but just overall in to like to where I am now in like metal. I think those, those ones are definitely up there. You know, like I, I was never m- much of a, like a, like a prog kid. I, I don't, I don't think I ever owned a dream theater mm-hmm. album. I never owned a Steve Same. I album. It's so interesting. Cause a lot of my peers in the, in this prog world are, 
you know, like yeah. Steve I comes to town and yeah. they're there and they're like, oh, seeing seeing the legend tonight. And I'm not, I, I just, I don't know. I've never listened to, I've never listened to, if you paid me, if you, if anyone here said, I'll give you a thousand dollars to name one Steve I song, well, well, I can't Nick, do it. I don't know the same like, name of a single song. You, you kind of grew up similarly in that capacity or Jared, you, you throw yourself on the list too, because I'd say Kevin as well. But like, you know, the way we kind of grew up is a little different in the sense of how like maybe some of our peers are listening to a little bit more, I don't know if commercially viable or just a little bit more popular or whatever, you know, like a little bit more just like popular consciousness music. But, you know, I mean, we were growing up listening to guys who are like literally, you know, dead for years, you know, don't have that kind of audience or draw at all anymore. You know, it's not the music of the time, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So it's like those kinds of things, like what, what, what was it that took it yeah. to that place for you? You know, because I mean, I could say, you know, my dad, whatever, because, like, he was literally there. But, like, you're just choosing to listen to, like, jazz. You know what I mean? And and I don't know exactly, like, the whole list of your influences and everything. But, I mean, like, anything from, like, fucking Django to West Montgomery or whatever. You know what I mean? That's not, like, your typical, like, I don't know, like, Metallica, Slayer, fucking Pantera, you know, growing up type of thing. You know what I mean? So it's, like, where in your life did you feel like, you know, that you you were even gonna interact with that stuff considering that you were just like so drawn to just other kinds of music in general you know because like that that's a whole different world in and of itself i i think um well i was definitely sh shedding jazz i was playing jazz in school and then like in the all county band all and, county um, <laughs> yeah let's I was, go you know, and i was listening to, and, <laughs> yo Get out that get out that hollow body. You never mentioned Let's actually. Uh, uh, Jacob and Nick actually. Jacob and Nick actually went to the same. Did you? Go, you didn't go to East Meadow, did you? Yes, they did. Uh, oh, yeah, I did. You yeah, went to East dude. Meadow. You guys didn't fucking know this. Were we? How did I know I, this? I didn't know that. No. I know that. I know that your brother. Um, like he was the one of the, so we studied with the same teacher for a while, Mike Frost, and he, and your brother was one of the main oh, reasons yeah. why I started playing those Clifford Roy basses because I I wanted to oh funny like they were the best basses ever that I've ever played up until now obviously but um <laughs> um yeah but they're, so they're incredible so yeah they are. <laughs> but they're they're like the most incredible basses I've ever played but it, but his was the first time his video was the only video on the internet where someone was playing one in like a metal context. And I was like, Oh, okay, cool. So yeah, I'm definitely going to get one of these now, but I had no idea that I had no idea That's you guys funny. were East metal kids. That's hysterical. Yeah. East metal high school. Damn. Um, Mr. Angle, Dude, band director, Angle. Mr. Uh, shout out Mr. Angle. Uh, shit, shit. Paul Caputo, Paul, Mr. Caputo. Yeah. Uh, no, Angle know. is Angle is like the only teacher one of the only teachers like, be like, hey, you gotta be better. And I was like, oh shit, all right, cool. <laughs> yeah, they're cool. I had a good yeah. relationship with them. Um, yeah, but I was listening to on the jazz side, like Ben Monder, um, and you know, like Holdsworth and Schofield. I didn't find out about Krantz until college, and like Rosenwinkel and stuff. That was like what I was working on. And I was like, I remember I have vivid memories of like transcribing Wayne Shorter at home. But then Billy and I had a mutual friend where we'd go to his house and like work out in the basement and stuff. Like I had like the, the, the studious type A jazz part of my brain where I was like, I'm going to sit down and practice until like I'm the best. And then I had this other part of my brain was like, yeah, but I also want to like drink too much and lift weights and like, and like, <laughs> yeah, and, 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 like work out and like, <laughs> Some of those old pictures of Nick are so fucking intimidating. Bro, yeah, you can still Google them to this day. They're there someplace. <laughs> no sleeves ever. Um, and so when 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 that part of my life was going on, Billy and I were like in a basement lifting weights, listening to like Ion Dissonance, which is still a sick track. Have you put on Ion Dissonance? Yes. Ion Dissonance beneath the mask. What's that other one? Oh fuck, I'm not gonna remember, but. I and yeah, I understand. But then, but then we started listening to Cynic, uh, Cynic's Focus. Uh, we started listening to, and then I found out oh, about Thorndall's Special Defects, right. and then, and then I think when I heard the Special Defects, and then you know got into Meshuga. That's when everything started coming together. And like um, I'd say, like the first, the first ever Four Thirds songs are really a culmination of, like. Like the, those sounds of Thorndall, Ion Dissonance, Special Defects, like Spineless is probably mostly inspiration from like ion dissonance more than anything else have you put on that what is that a little bit of danza as well ion dissonance the, 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 the herd is it the herd 
The herd, yeah, the, the herd, herd by Iron. No, the surge. the surge. Sorry, but that I don't know. But wait, so what, does this remind you of anything? I was telling this to Chris the other day, but I remember you used to listen to a lot of Sufjan Stevens back in the day, and you can actually totally hear stuff that you kind of like really were super influenced by it in like those earlier records. Oh yeah, yeah, his like songwriting uh, yeah. stuff. Um, yeah, Sufjan Stevens. Yeah, it was funny. Like we were not listening to maybe because it didn't exist yet, but you and I also didn't dabble in like the forums, like sevenstring.org yeah. and I don't know, no. whatever the fuck else there was. There was a lot of people like recording stuff at home and uploading their tracks to to these things. And you and I weren't doing that. We were really just keeping what we wrote and recorded to ourselves. And um and like you know, we were probably late to the MySpace thing. We were really just doing our own thing in a bubble. Um, Chris, are you at Billy's place right now? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> what I, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Eating cheese. Fuck, did you find cheese? Yeah. Cool. Let's let's uh, let's move on. Let's let's try let's popping over to a new subject here. The the reunion. The, did you the say the creating union? of the union? Uh, oh, I thought we were making the reunion. I'm just gonna get the state of the union right now. Oh, oh we were unionizing. <laughs> <laughs> We are now. <laughs> Let me see. You're not invited. I'm just joking. How can we? How can we share sneak peeks on here? Uh, share. How can I'll we share sneak peeks? I can songs? play them. I have. I have you routed uh, to my iTunes, so I can just play songs if you want. It. I'm gonna take a pee pee while you do that. Do it. Let's. Uh, well, let's pick. Let's pick. Let's pick something. Um, pick a pick a spot, Jacob. We can each. We can each maybe pick a spot. Let's see. I'm trying to think. Find some some something good. I don't know. There's there's so many things. I don't know. Pick the first one that comes to mind. Let's do the well. Just that whole song is ridiculous. Yeah. Maybe just like twenty seconds or so. I'll blast my head off. It's pretty heavy. That's pretty sick. That reminds me of just like like drinking like Jack Daniels at like. Uh, <laughs> At like a, Finish that thought, Nick. What if they, like, you, a, you, you mean like Born of Osiris? Is that what you're like talking? A, <laughs> like a, no, like at like a pickup, at like a pickup truck party, like a like a big pickup truck bonfire party in like Are Alabama. You frequenting <laughs> fucking pickup truck bonfire <laughs> party. <Yeah. or> <laughs> it's not. This is not kick the dust up. You know. <laughs> yeah. What was the what was the, what was the last yeah, this, pickup this, this, bonfire this, fire party no, you've been to? You've been to a lot. Last That's when they drive the pickup truck. Everyone's playing. Everyone's playing like. Happened. <laughs> Everyone's playing like Luke Holmes and fucking Luke Bryant, and then he just plays Luke fucking. <laughs> this is a very <laughs> angry. Wait, you guys don't wait. You guys no. don't like this? Why not? What's what's wrong? Yeah, that, that's slashing the tires on the pickup truck. Yeah. Yeah, dude. <laughs> you know what? It's more of a it's more of an insane that's, clown part. Insane clown uh, party. That's, that's, that's a dude showing yeah, yeah. up to a pickup truck party with a Tesla. <laughs> that's what that is. <laughs> <laughs> that's what that's that is. Fucked up part. <laughs> I really do like. I really do like how that song opens up. Yeah. I do like that whole song. Uh, Jared, I remember. I remember sending you that riff like the day that we wrote it, and you you just said something really funny. You're like, "Dang, this is like." I think you referenced. I think you referenced Dimebag. It, I think it, it does, does have, have like, like some Dimebag Pantera, guy. like proggy Pantera, Lamb of God vibes. Yeah, because you're just but, one. It's it's in like yeah. D minor, which is all. It's all Pantera it's and D, all yeah. fucking. Uh, Lamb of God, and you're just hey, for you're you're chugging on you're chugging on you know doing the palm mute thing you know yeah which is you know I get it kind of pentatonic y kind of pentatonic it's interesting because it's straight from Heart yeah. Machine the whole is structure yeah it was yeah, pretty natural definitely. writing to that to be nice. honest I felt like I was writing a Heart Machine song again and yeah. and I remember actually like so I think the screams were always like they were never in question and I I think I tried writing something. Uh, to the chorus that was like maybe a little too busy or a little too playful or something. And uh, cause I think maybe I was trying to take a different approach. I was like, let's not make this sound like the heart machine. <laughs> and, and then I think uh, Nick, you got back to me and like, let's simplify. Let's think, think heart machine. <laughs> yeah, yeah, simplify. Like, right. All right. All right. Here we go. It's, and then, yeah, it's funny. Cause I, I mean, I like there. how it turned out, but yeah, three I, of it, I know. Yeah, yeah. Three of you were in the heart machine, which is interesting. Ever heartbreak? Yeah. <laughs> Dang. Uh, when I was, I think that song was the last song I learned before tracking drums. So I was kind of 
uh, under the, I think I learned that maybe like a week or two before I went to Anoops to record it. And that middle section before the jazz breakdown, I, Nick, I think I was like messaging you, yeah. messaging you like every hour telling you to go fuck yourself. That's actually, <laughs> I was like, what the fuck? It's so, cause it was like, that might be the hardest like thing I ever had. A, one of the hardest things I ever had to learn how to play. And it's just like, it's relentless. It's like one section after another. Like it's all completely impossible to play on drums. So I just actually just transcribed the, the program drum part, which I don't know what happened. I just envisioned you like, like, Oh, okay. We need to program drums here. And just like putting all your hands on the keyboard and the drum map and just like, <laughs> Are you talking about the, well still? the well, yeah. Yeah. The middle section be- you know what I'm talking about, right? Before the jazz, uh, I do. Oh, that, section was, that section was impossible to, to like write bass to, because there's so <laughs> much weird shit going on. I'm like, where is the root? Where is I, I the root? You posted, <laughs> I posted a video of being like, attention, like metal guitarists, please write mu- like easier music or something yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was that. literally <laughs> that section. Yeah. yeah, I didn't even try to write anything over it. I'm like, I, I got nothing. I'm just gonna play the program part. But I was, yeah, it, which is literally like it's something that no drummer would ever think to play on the own, you know. But somehow it works, you know. That's like, uh, it sounds just, sick. The whole thing sounds sick now. Yeah. Now, mm-hmm. yeah. Now, now I hear it as being normal. But at the time, I'm like, holy fuck! I don't know. How I'm gonna be able to play this. The quality also sounds like just so much better. I think from the first record. So I think you guys did a wonderful job in that aspect as well. Because we took time to do everything. Yeah. Still, yeah. I mean, but also still very DIY. Yeah. Like, it, it sounds super. It still sounds superhuman. You know? That's the one thing that I was like curious about when when I before I even listened to anything. If you guys, because like with the first with the 2011 one, it's very much like you said, like it sounds very DIY, which is really cool because you kind of lose that human element in a mm-hmm. lot of the more modern metal stuff. And with this, it's like, and even with the new stuff, you you know the drums. You know, they sound great, but it sounds like a person playing them. It doesn't sound like, you know, GGD or, um, or the, you know, everything sounds like, yeah. like it's, it was played, not just like super yeah. punched in and, you know, which again is something that gets lost a lot. I, I still really regret that on the first record I didn't, you know, back then we had zero budget. So I, I really wish that there, we had the, the means and time to actually track real drums on that. Mm-hmm. But the so whole thing I was really like, oh, sure. it's done. Hey, everything's just done. We didn't do a single fucking thing right. Amen. What'd you guys do? Like, just Perfect. like, all right, this is like, I mean, it it just sounds like the, when you open up Slate, it just sounds like that, but like, you know, a little bit no, better. No, it, it's basically literally just uh, all the demo tracks of guitar, Nick playing the bass, and then uh, all programmed drums from drum, uh, Superior Drummer. And then Superior the second Drummer, Chris yeah, had, okay. The second Chris just laid down vocals, it, we, it was just done, and we didn't do another thing to it. Just respect. out the window because yeah. respect. <laughs> yeah, but you know it was a product. But even but even this one, yeah. Even even this even this album, like we to this day we don't like like we haven't really approached writing this stuff in the same way that a lot of bands uh, do it. Like most of the takes on on this stuff are, are like long form takes. Like Billy and I aren't sitting there editing guitar parts. Like we're not cutting up, we're not like reviewing. I don't think Billy and I have ever said like, okay, like go record and then stop. And then like Billy's gone back and cut things and move things over. Like if you look at the, if you look at the files, they're, they're full. Yeah. It's a lot. Yeah. These are full, mm-hmm. like eight, eight, eight bar regions. Yeah. In I logic. think the most you, we've done was like you being like, mm, I don't think that was tight enough when we just redid it. But then like, we like, it maybe if there was something that was majorly wrong, we fixed it, but we never just sat there being like, okay, can we edit this tighter? Can, you know, can we go back to this riff and replay it? It was mostly just on the spot. If you didn't feel if it was good, then we would redo it. But that's most, mostly it. I was going to say that like, there is this element of, um, of playing that I think to your point, Jacob, um, that, uh, I mean, especially since saying that, you know, like that, that translates through, through the playing and through the record then, you know what I mean? Cause it just, you can you can hear when bands are, are really producing, you know, you can hear when things are really chopped up. I mean, like, uh, it's it's just got its own sound, you know what I mean? And so it's there's a difference when you hear somebody kind of digging in and and trying to play it and play it that way rather than relying on, like, any kind of post-production to make that kind of stuff happen. 
And um, sure. And again, like there are bands that do that, and it's no, sick. no, for sure. And, like, I mean, like I'm not putting that down. No, no, at no. All, I mean, that it's, works. It's, it, it, I mean, if you make that work mm-hmm. and that works for you, man, and it sounds good, as long as it sounds good, I mean, that's all that really matters at the end of the day. You know what I mean? Sure. But um, you know, there's a certain authenticity to the uh, to the sound in a way that. I think you might not be able to capture as easily in in a way because um, there's just something about playing through it that just has this has this vibe, right. has this sound, has this complete personality to it. And then, um, I mean, you know, it's, it's something that I feel like I was very fortunate to be able to share that with you. And I've been able to share that with a lot of different people and musicians in my life, thankfully. But like, I guess just from, from the experience of the first record to this one, that to me sounds like a like a step up because it sounds like um just sounds like there's like a little bit more like life and uh yeah i mean i I think that translates to like overall sort of like joy and fulfilling experience musically and even if you can't really articulate the reason why you know it's just it's a subtle thing that gives gives it an extra bit of color in its own way and um yeah fucking well done I, I like that you just said like you can't you may, even if you can't really tell or you can't put your you can't pinpoint why it sounds a little bit different. I just had a co- podcast with Sam Meradian, like this guitarist, uh, plays in Fallujah, and uh, we talked a little bit about the un- uh, uncanny valley and how like doing certain things and hyper editing and like using extensive backing tracks and live performances and stuff. Like as a listener, you don't know why. It feels uncanny, but you know that you yeah. do feel something about it. Whereas if you go into a room and you listen to like, if you go into like the Vanguard and you listen to a trio play, like, like I saw Schofield play solo, John Schofield play solo guitar two nights ago at the Capitol Theater in Port Chester. And this is the guy sitting playing into a tube amp with his loop pedal. And it was like the most soulful, organic yeah. human thing I've heard in, in such a long time. And uh, I'm not saying that one is better or worse than the other, but I am saying that as an un, um, as a listener who's like not even thinking about this stuff, they're just a person that likes to listen to music. They lo- they like both prog bands, and they like yeah. Nirvana, and they like John Schofield, and they like jazz, and they like rock. They just they like to listen to music, but they don't they don't dabble in the technical aspects of it. Um, yeah, yeah. I think there is a feeling of uncanniness when you listen to something that is a little bit too. A little bit too uh, perfect. I think one 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 thing that uh, I mean, my favorite drummers. The the thing I like listening to them. What one reason that I listen to them is just to hear their personalities through their playing. You know, and sometimes that involves oh, this guy plays a little bit behind the beat. You know, this guy plays a little bit on top. This guy's time is uh, like a little bit squirrely within one bar, but in the course of five bars, somehow it works out. You know, when you do a lot of editing, you totally suck that vibe 100%. out of it. But you get the you get that perfection. Yeah. You know, I mean, like ima- imagine quantizing D'Angelo's I mean, voodoo. Okay. No. Well, well, that that record Perfect would be like ex- yeah, you know, no, like. Yeah, like that. The whole vibe of that, that is would just be sacrilege. You yeah. know, yeah, yeah. Where are they? Where are they putting the beat? Yeah, where are they yeah, putting yeah. the time? You and might be. You might be put on a sense of drama. You might be put on a watch list for just saying that. You know what? Fucking put me <laughs> on it too. Like, just for real, like that's <laughs> yeah. that's that's that's, that's <laughs> like, probably that's one crazy. of the best examples you could say because, like, I mean, yeah. certainly we can speak to any respect what whatever you're trying to accomplish. You know, I think at the end of the day, Nick, you're touching on something. You know, it's like when we're. When we're speaking of the of of the listener and the the audience, you know, like I don't like the word fan because I'd like to give people more credit to what they're listening to. But like, when the audience or the listener is is experiencing this music, you know, like I don't think we should necessarily have to think of every listener as like the way we listen to music, which is like that nuanced musician sort of way. You know what I mean? Like it's 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 a different experience, and we all try to have that in our own way but you know as the musicians ourselves we, we we take it somewhere else but i mean like when you are playing this kind of stuff and and then like when you got something like jerry was just saying like that d'angelo kind of thing versus like something that's i i don't even know because like i'm trying to think of like a like like a bad example <laughs> um God, like there's some like real MySpace kind of stuff I'm thinking of from back in the day that I don't even remember the name, but it's just like hyper. It sounds like a computer, basically. You know what I mean? And anyway, 
can't remember the name of anything, but that kind of like when anything starts to sound like you're actually listening to something that looks like the stock program and like fucking garage band or whatever, you know, it's like, there's a, there's a, a mechanicalness that, I mean, it's a, you, there's a time, time and a place for it for sure. But an uneducated listener can, without even no, that being able to put the words behind it, can distinguish the two. No, no. Like, like it's, I, cause, cause it's uneducated is true, but at the same time, it's like, you know, I'm not trying to make it anybody's fault or anything like that. You know what I mean? Like fucking it's a million other things going on in the world, but like you just musically speaking, when you, when I don't know, like to use wine or like coffee or something as an example, you know, like when you first taste that stuff, you know, it all kind of just tastes like coffee or alcohol, you know what I mean? But like you have a little more time with it, you have a little more experience with it, you start to distinguish flavors, notes, you know, like, and these ideas start to take on those tangents. And I mean, music is no different. And, and once you start getting to these like more nuanced places with listening, I just even think, even just like for lack of a better way of putting it, the, the average listener, you know, can start to distinguish what's like got some real stuff over versus what like is, I guess another way of putting it is just that like a product, you know what I mean? And um, it's, it's something that I think as the artist, I struggle with in, in the modern medium, because like, I think in this day and age now, especially with AI, having the ability to like make so much music just by listening to something and then just copying it and remaking it in its own way or whatever, you know, like it just brings into question what is like, what is good music, especially if something like that can like be reproduced. And like, I, I try to, I try to keep an open mind and be fair, but like, I just think the, the philosophy of the question stands like, you know, like wh where do we fit in the whole conversation of like what we're trying to accomplish musically what is good music? You know, should we be judging it as such? You know what I mean? Does it matter? Should we just be like everybody says, you know, it's like, it's just an objective thing. So do whatever you want. You know, like there's this weird relationship that we have as musicians of trying to have fun, embrace the joy and creativity of it all, but then also like have these standards of sorts, at least to our own liking. And um, yeah, it's just weird. You know, how, how, how that all works out. Yeah, it's it's definitely it's definitely hard, and it's definitely been a point of contention in Ever Forthright for as long sure. as Ever Forthright's been around. Like, we need to sound tighter and heavier and competitive with these like heavy bands, but also how do we like remain true about how do we practice what yeah, we preach yeah. and like not do that? So it is it is really hard, and like different members of the band have different perspectives on it than others. But I think it is that checks and balances that makes things come That's out true. the way they do. At the end, at the end of the day, um, hey Jacob, play eight minutes and forty five seconds on Tech and Flux. Coming right up. Yeah, okay. I actually wanted to just jump in here real quick because uh, part of this is like, you know, um, so like, so so um, you know, like seeing a band live and it being to backing tracks and the tempos being exactly the same. I definitely feel I, I can definitely feel when a band is playing to tracks and is trying to emulate the record. And as an audience member, sometimes I feel like like, oh, God, these guys are like so perfect and they sound exactly like the record. And a lot of the time I leave those concerts feeling like I just rather sit home and listen to the record because I want to go see a band live sound different. <laughs> I kind of want to hear the imperfections. I want to hear the mistakes. Um, you know, there's something to seeing like, oh, this band, this this song is uh, five BPM faster than the record and it's speeding up a little bit. It kind of gives you the human element that you don't get with an over edited <laughs> record. Um, I, I heard a, somebody said, told me that Pavathini started playing with sequencers uh I guess in the eighties with the Pat Metheny group. And he felt like all the songs were slowing down. So he actually programmed the songs to speed up gradually by five to 10 BPM oh, sure. just to give it that kind of human feeling. Oh, sure. Because it was just like, Oh man, like I feel like every song is dragging. And it's like, no, it's not dragging. We're playing to a, a click. So he, he had them speed up. Um, so yeah, that's one thing. Like I felt, a, I felt, bored on a lot of the metal shows i've seen lately because i'm just like oh well it's just i just feel like i'm hearing the record from the 
a bigger PA than I, I have. I, I would agree with that um, in spirit, at least, you know. I think, like, Deftones is a good example of, of like, a kind of modernish band that, that definitely doesn't do that. Like, they, they fucking play stuff that's, like, half tempo sometimes of what it is on the record, and it's just so... It's, yeah, yeah, I want to hear something different. I want to say one last thing before we fire up a uh, well, part of the album that I really connected with. Um, and then you've you've probably all heard this expression, what's old is new again, and things are cyclical. And, like, and, I, and I think we are coming to a point where progressive metal has been so oversaturated and things are... are and there's so much competition in the, uh, in the loudness wars and um, that things are going to come full circle if they are, haven't already. And uh, I think it's something like realness is going to be something we're going to see more of like bands plugging into amps bands, just playing like after again, like talking like Jared and I played some of my music a couple weeks ago and a lot of a lot of that stuff is like improvising and, and jamming and just playing playing together granted we do have backing tracks because we can't afford a bass player but <laughs> um but a lot of it is like us us listening to each other and and jamming and uh after the set most of the criticism that we got or the response that we got was like man that was like just so refreshing to watch someone just play that's not a criticism for, like four minutes <laughs> yeah. whatever the whatever the word is uh yeah, and um, and I, I just think that there's going to be more of that. It makes me wish that I saw bands like Nirvana back in the day. Definitely. You can go, you should listen to like, you guys listen to Loathe. They're kind of like uh, doing, I mean, they play the tracks, but I, they're they're doing the real doing am that. thing. No one's on. It's, it's there. And if you like Deftones, you'll, you'll fuck with them. But any, do you guys listen to that band? I've checked them out. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I've listened to yeah, that one a times. Like, they're kind of uh, like at the yeah. forefront of that. And the, yeah, they're, yeah, one of my favorite bands, like modern bands, anyway. I love the. I like. I just like their yeah. harmonic approach a lot. Yes. I, I I can't get involved sometimes with some of the the vocals, but like I I do love the the vibe of it overall. Man, they've got a they've they've got definitely cool. like that old school sort of like '90s meets like the modern reinterpretation thing. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, it's coming. Sure. Uh, and I think music videos are coming back that way too. I'm seeing a little bit more like low budget, fun DIY music videos popping off with like 700,000 mm -hmm. plus views and like the super ultra high budget stuff being a little bit like, uh, we've seen all the animated things and man, with especially with AI starting to crank out music videos and stuff mm -hmm. now, I'm sure like what you can do at home with your, with like a, like a, I wouldn't be surprised if someone puts out a music video using like the camcorder they've stuffed yeah. into their attic for the last for thirty sure. years. Do you, do you remember like, the make a, make a music video with the that? The Meshuga New Millennium Cyanide Christ music that video. Like the the video. Yeah, right. Fucking yeah. yeah. That was a best. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, this like every video becomes like that now. Yeah, just I remember seeing that bus. on like on like Headbangers Ball when I was yeah. like I think I was must have been like twelve or something. <laughs> it, was, it was so wow. sick. <laughs> I really like I really like nowhere. Nowhere's yeah. videos are are awesome. Oh yeah, you true. Check them out. Yeah. Oh, or Concours, oh God, Concours, oh, videos, Concours videos, just videos guys so driving good. around on the bus. Like, yeah, they're so good. Hey, Jacob, fire up that yeah, thing. Yeah. Eight forty-five. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's one of my spots. Like yeah. like going from that like backbeat to finding a way to get back into like the heavy mm -hmm. prog stuff. I've always that and that section is so old. That section is years yeah. and years old. And uh, it had programmed drums for the longest time. And then Jared put the real drums on it and Yeah, that was I, I one thing where the, um, I, Oh sorry, go ahead. Oh no! I was just gonna say. I think the original plan with the Tech and Flux, like that, was gonna be a, a complete standalone EP, if I'm remembering correctly. Like it was gonna be like a half hour long. So this is like it's a ten minute long plus track, fourteen something like that. 
And that's actually the edited down version. That's crazy. <laughs> yeah. Um, with, with, yeah, I remember just with this section, there were certain parts where, because a lot of the stuff I recorded to, it wasn't final mixed drums. So there were certain p parts of the record where I would just record to the program stuff, like a lot of the stuff with like, really sporadic crazy kick patterns i would go for the listen to the program stuff but then something like this i would look at i would look at obviously the the final track drums and say okay cool he's behind here this is where the snare is this is where the kick is so sections like this i you know i would look at the i, I would use like the drums as my grid rather than you know just looking at where it looked like looking at the whatever daw i was using and um yeah, I think that's how we kind of captured that. Would you say like, that it Yeah, this was definitely like D'Angelo vibes. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, well, I'm all... Yeah, exactly. No, exactly. It's it's one of those moments where, you know, shit isn't just laid out for you. Yeah. Like, it was, it was very much like, all right, cool, this is a section where I'm just going to one-take it and, you know, do my best Pino Palladino impression. Very cool, very cool. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, well... Yeah, it was a good one. Just from your experience, how does that feel just, like, in context to so much of other stuff that you do, which is on the grid, you know what I mean? Does that, like... Yeah. What, what does that do for well, you it's, as, it's as a musician, you know what I mean? Like, what does that do for you? Yeah, I mean, with the stuff I do with, like, intervals, it's very much, like, we... It's very much... It's very produced, and a lot, and most of it is to the grid, um... So it, it's just like refreshing to just be able to, you know, pretend I'm just in the room and just vibing out with, yeah. with something that is very much, you know, the opposite where I'm just not even listening for the metronome. I'm just trying to like, you know, stay with the drums. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a different kind of, um, cause with, with the interval stuff, it's, it's very much, you know, it, it's really, it's a, such an awesome feeling when you can kind of replicate all that crazy gridded shit live like that. It's, it's so cool to be able to play with musicians that do that. And, but then where you go to the opposite spectrum where you can play with someone who is, you know, you're using the drums and that's your, that's your, yeah, click. Yeah. that's, that's what you're trying to follow. That's like your pocket. So there's definitely like with, with the interval stuff, there's definitely like, you know, me and Nate kind of established this kind of you could still call it a pocket i guess because we're we're still inherently we're still yeah. listening for no, each absolutely. other yeah but but this is this is more of you know when you say when you hear the term pocket like sections like this is kind of what you know you'd i imagine people would imagine i was just thinking like do you find yourself ever just sort of like considering that everything is like because i'm assuming you play with in years as well when you when you yeah, yeah for like, sure do you have the click going on and like do you kind of in a way just zone out and almost go on autopilot you know what I mean? no, no no it's i have the click i have the click going but in my ears it's like myself yeah. drums um a little bit of backing tracks and like like a whisper of guitars because okay, okay. it's just i do yeah i just it's like me and drums and that's and I, I kind of have the leads a little just because there's a couple of unison lines that I got to pay attention yeah. to. But it's, yeah, I just make the joke that like none of the guys in the band, if they ha if their mix got fucked for some reason, if they switched to mine, they'd have a horrible show. Fair enough. But, that's, but that helps you stay yeah. kind of cued in though, right? Because like you're just kind of like... Yeah, exactly. Okay. No, no. I was, I, I was your pee pee, Nick. That's, that was that's good. good. Things are still working as, like, as expected. Hell yeah, we love that. your Discord for them. <laughs> I know. What were some of your most memorable ever forthright tour experiences? Jared stepping in shit number one. That when oh, we got on the bus and the bus was swarmed with flies. <laughs> it's a different kind of memorable oh, now. Oh, that sucks. God. It's a nightmare. It's hard to pick one. It's a nightmare. <laughs> well, I just did it, so I have a lot of That was the same night that we were talking about when we the one time we played Riot, that was the night. We we totally uh, Bosch Riot live, and then after the show, we had that happen. That and remember so, when we went to Scranton, and your whole family was there. Like I was just about to bring that up. Actually, that was one of my was best fun. fucking shows. Yeah, yeah, me too. That was a great that was show. A fun show. Yeah. It was very house. weird. We were playing yeah. in like it was kind of like a hangar or something, mm -hmm. and um, yeah, man, I just remember fucking we were firing on something that night musically man it was it felt great yeah that yeah. was a good show i want to talk about industry insights actually a little bit um because i to this day know very little about the music industry i i, I frankly 
I, I don't understand it. Really, I, don't know if I don't know if I'll ever understand it. <laughs> You're in the wrong podcast, <laughs> my friend. <laughs> we have. Yeah. <laughs> but scholars uh, have been baffled since it began. <laughs> But I mean, we have people here that have toured a, a shit ton. Chris, you've toured all over the damn place. Jacob, you've, you're you touring all over the dang place, playing on a zillion records. Mike, you're doing a ton of studio work. Like, um, I'm looking at a couple of questions uh, here that I frankly can't answer. Let me just go through these and, and see what pops in your minds. As early, as early pioneers in the original wave of prog metal, how do you view the current state of the genre, genre and its popularity within the music industry? That's one. Keep that in the back of your mind. Share your thoughts on the challenges and opportunities for independent artists in today's digital age, especially in niche genres. Um, let me get two more of these out real quick, and then I want to pop to each one of you guys. How has your experience navigating the music, music industry over the years shaped your perspective perspective on success and artistic fulfillment um discuss the impact of online communities platforms and digital content in shaping the prog metal slash jazz fan base that's a lot of stuff there well, why don't you why don't, why don't you hit this one big daddy Jakob? oh man uh, all right well i'm not an early i i wouldn't consider myself an early pioneer well, um, you're out there right now what what, what are you but, experiencing uh, these days? yeah so uh, I guess I can kind of touch on all three of these things. Uh, let's see, uh, independent artist. So when I when I started with intervals, um, that was kind of my you know the thing where it like I kind of launched what I'm doing now. Um, I I had it in mind just from early on that it wasn't going to be like a, it's not like a real it's it's intervals right but it's it's aaron is like the main guy and that's and I so when I joined that group I I kind of knew I'd have to um somehow use that to like build my own platform yeah. as as like an individual artist so from there you know i i would you know i, I did the touring and then when when i kind of had a name for myself i i approached different companies like dingwall and and dark glass and i saw the music as an opportunity to to kind of show you know how intricate the parts were and you start doing playthroughs even if i hadn't played on those records yet um i kind of just you know started focusing the music a little bit more on the bass and that got the attention of other companies like like dark glass and dingwall and neural so uh, you know there comes work there comes you know tutorial videos and, and endorsements and then from then on you know people see me doing videos and they ask me to play on their records so it just kind of using using something that again wasn't it's not my band but just that as like a launching off point and um you know if you can you know and if you're in my position that's kind of what you have to do and and then if you get lucky you know you again because you have to i would just say you just can't just be in a band like it's hard to just just be in a band like you have guys like tosin and and misha and all these guys with you know they have horizon they have a bossy they they have signature guitars they have signature plugins it's all it's all um culminating to being successful and and you know for me i, I was lucky enough to be approached by this company submission audio to do a, a library like that and that was another game changer for me so yeah it's just you know having your hands in a bunch of different pots and and again it's like it's just what they tell you in like music school when you start off like say yes to everything like yeah. so when i started out i was i was doing sessions for you know whoever would hire me and now and that was enabled me to build a pretty extensive body of our portfolio so now i have you know if someone like like the last record i played on was like i played on a song with marty friedman and nita strauss which was like the one of the coolest things i got to do um yeah so it's just you know, but that led, that all comes from me just again, like saying yes to everything. And, um, yeah. So just being, uh, looking out for yourself and just, you know, knowing that, you know, if you're in a band, you want to be able to have leverage as just a musician and not just as a member of a band. Cause if the intervals, I, I knew if like the intervals thing, I, if the intervals thing was to go, then I, I didn't want to, that to be my only, the only thing I was doing. Um, and in terms of like, like where the prog state is today i think it's in a it's a really cool place just because of how big the genre has gotten this small niche genre how you know we have bands like animals as leaders and like polyphia and like all these other bands that are like blowing up playing you know two thousand to four thousand cap venues it's it's super cool um so i think at the 
I think that in in that regard, it's really cool to see how much recognition the genre is getting. But on the other hand, I see like a lot of just like a lot of things like on Instagram of just guys trying to do the same thing, which there's like, um, there's becoming a kind of like, I'm trying to think of the word, like a formula to it, which I, I, I'm not really super into, but, um, yeah, so that's my, my thoughts. I just thought I'd just like take all the I questions think, and I think that applies to other, I think that applies to other genres as well. Oh, like without the a doubt, without a doubt. Thing. Country I think, music. I think it's just, I think it's super natural. Yeah. I think it's super natural for an artist, whatever they might be doing, jazz, rock, country, like all the shit that I don't know about in other parts of the world. And then for other people to be influenced by it, I think, I don't know if it's like an Instagram algorithm thing that that's mostly what I'm fed on Instagram because of the kind of music that I play and write. Mm -hmm. um, or if like the prog metal world is just so heavily invested in social media. Yeah. Um, it's kind of a human condition like, thing at you know. this point as well, you know? Yeah. It's, it's crazy. I just think it's crazy that like when you see guy, I mean, you know, I, all the stuff I post on Instagram is either, it's either something that's going to be a song or it's an, you know, or it's a song that's already out. It's a playthrough, but I, I very rarely write riffs. I don't think I've actually ever done this where it's just exclusively something for like, I've spent time writing something just cause it's going to be a one second clip or a 15 second or 30 second clip for Instagram. Yeah. Um, and you see guys that are doing that, that are killing it. And I have friends that do that. Um, but it's, it's interesting when you see guys like that and they don't have like music out. That's, that's the weird thing. That for is me. weird. You got to get in the room and play that shit. It is. Yeah. That's a new, yeah. I talk about that a lot on, the, on this podcast yeah. too. Is but you have guys like, like that, like, that oh, angle is <sighs> that just that that is, a, that is a possible angle these days that um, yeah. you could just be someone that pumps out 30 second, um, Clips, clips and those guys yeah. have a hundred thousand plus followers sometimes mm -hmm. and um yeah and they don't have any any music out but no one's no one's no one's forcing anyone to put out an album you don't have to put out an album if, yeah like, no if for sure if you're sure. doing what you want to be doing and that's that's it you know it's not what i would want to do but there is there is an angle there is an angle mm -hmm. for that i mean it's not like there's going to be any royalties in your spotify streams anyway so shit right um <laughs> I don't know how those people make money. I guess, I guess, I guess, uh, I mean, it depends on how you go about I guess, it nowadays. Uh, anyway. endorse, like, product. Yeah. You know, it's, it's very interesting. It's in many ways, ha, ha, as much as things have changed, everything sort of stays the same. You know, um, I, I, for some reason I think of like the early two thousands when like Napster was a big thing and then the record industry absolutely destroyed that and rebuilt itself. And now here we are in the wake of all of that. We have fucking Spotify, Apple music, you know, all this other shit. And, um, you know, with all of the stuff that you were just talking about, Jacob, I, it's interesting for me because I, uh, I've been really bad at all of that. Like I've, I've not been like, not someone to talk about in, in, with any kind of expertise on that stuff, just cause, um, I don't know, maybe I'm not good at it or like, there was a lot of parts of just my life that just never translated to, I guess, cause I was, I don't know. I'm just, I'm, I'm kind of stuck in my own head with my art, you know, like I, I get personal with it and, uh, it takes on a different sort of thing for me. And so like monetizing it has been very difficult for me because I, uh, it's just such a form of expression and as cliche and cheesy as that sounds, you know, like, uh, I, I've just, I always thought that like, I would just kind of like, do the thing and, and use my musicianship as the means of which to kind of do that and also then survive. But I think that also mm. kind of comes from my upbringing as well. Cause I was kind of taught that, you know, like for like we're better at putting it the Ray Barreto school. And he would always just be like, you know, you practice, you play, you become the best you can be. And you know, you make a living, you gig, but I don't think mm. he was, you know, my dad was born in 1929 for anybody listening that gives a shit, but like, you know, that kind of world doesn't exist anymore. And uh, as, as I was growing up, you know, born in 1985 and, and growing up through the 90s and into the early aughts and everything, that, that world rapidly started to disappear. And so um, when I got my start, you know, and I was super lucky and, and fucking 
super grateful that I did. Cause I mean, looking back now, you know, I'm, I'm just some Puerto Rican kid from New York that fucking happened to sing in one of the most ahead of its time. And, and now one of the most popular bands in, in, in metal in the world. But, uh, you know, my philosophy, there was no Instagram. There was no real internet like that. I mean, YouTube was just beginning and, uh, <laughs> It was just chasing it, you know, it was just chasing music. It was chasing the sound and just like you were saying, you know, say yes to everything. But, um, but like being there was my version, you know, like Mm -hmm. if I could, if I could find a way to be in that room, that's what I wanted to do. And, uh, just Mm -hmm. to be around those people was, was my dream. And then, um, I mean, you know, I, it's just something about me and my life. You know, if I have something in my head, I get stuck on it. It's, I got to find a way to make it happen. It drives me crazy if I don't. And, uh, or I got to let it go. You know what I mean? One or the other. And, uh, and that's how I got my first sort of introduction to all this, you know, cause literally just playing in like starting in bands when I was 11 with my friends to then like literally just trying to find bands all throughout my teenage life. And then into going into my adult life, you know, trying to actually find more professional kind of bands. And then just like this local band out in Jersey, my friends, uh, fucking shout out to Rob and and JR and all them and Lamp Spreading from back in the day. And uh, that led me to my periphery fucking meeting. Uh, We played a show together randomly. And then that I, I ended up playing with periphery, you know, and then that turned into a stepping stone for for Haunted Shores and then friend for a foe and then ever forthright and heart machine and monuments i mean i've I've gotten to share the stage regardless of of whatever happens in my life you know i've I've had the wonderful privilege of sharing the stage with some of the most exceptionally gifted guitar players bass players drummers just people that are, are in the world that i love but then also at the same time you know what i've always considered the goal and the the nature of music, you know, is, is, is moving things forward and, and progressing the world quite literally in some kind of way. And even in our own small world, you know, I thought these guys were just like, you know, the same kind of jazz cats that, that I grew up with that my dad tried to teach me about and was like, you know, just pushing the idiom forward. So like, these were the guys that I just wanted to be around and just play, you know, cause I just wanted to play and, and then, you know, life kind of does kick in because you got to realize that, you know, you got to fucking keep the lights on and you got to fucking feed yourself and, and you got to do all that basic shit that, you know, after a while when you're, you know, 19, 20, 21, 22, you start to re- figure some small modicum of what it is all about. You try to make sense of it all. And, and so I, I I never could do like the endorsement thing and, and get that stuff together because I was just doing my head about like being on the road or just like flirting or, or or the whole kind of like life of it you know what i mean um i'm a bass player i didn't have to worry about that <laughs> <laughs> you know what <laughs> bullshit bass players get some of the get some of the best so i'm just saying um especially if you're good so you're just trying to say you're into the art side of it you're just not super interested in the business and social side of it you just want to make your art i don't know if it's something that i if i look back on like i regret or whatever you know i'm learned i've learned about that a lot in life and now like i feel like i've learned a lot with that now you know and 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 cats like you jacob mm-hmm. that are doing that you know like you're you're an example for me you know what i mean like quite literally you know because i realized coming from that world you know i have to adapt in my own way and um and, you know, it is a tool and you got, you got to take advantage of it, even if like you're not super into it, because that's my spirit. You know what I mean? Like, it's not like I consciously mm. want to wake up and like make a viral video, you know, like that would be sick. Right. But, you know, who the, that, that, that's a that's a mindset. In and if you go into it with that mentality, it's, it's also like a I, I, I I would I never think about stuff like that like but people do like, you know I, what I, I mean like yeah I know it's it's such a it's such a weird like when I get uh, uh, asked to do something and they're like oh dude this could this has the potential to like you know like go viral I'm like okay it's strange it's cool. almost is, does it, is it gonna like, sound is it gonna sound cool it, though like what's it yeah, sound like it's like it, it, <laughs> this isn't kind of like why I exist but you know yeah it, we 
And this is kind of what I was saying before, you know, like even back in the day, like, you know, we felt like we had to do certain things, to, you know, stay in whatever popular consciousness. And um, I mean, you know, MySpace was a great example for back then, you know, so like the mediums obviously changed now to like Instagram and TikTok and whatever. But, mm -hmm. you know, the same sort of shit still stands. You know, you still got to stand out to people. You still got to catch their attention. So like, you know. God, I'll never forget seeing this stupid sign back in the day, but, like, it, it's, it said something like, you know, you can't tell somebody's brain, like, how good-looking somebody's brain is, like, 20 feet away. And it's, like, reductionist and as, like, you know, shallow as that is, like, unfortunately, a lot of people are making a lot of judgments on you as an artist within the first 15, 20 seconds of seeing you. And seeing you is a very big part of that, you know what I mean? And not everybody's going to have this, like, look or this image that is so classical for either, like, a label traditionally or some kind of investor or, you know, or whatever kind of team that, you know, potentially looks for these kind of things to build a product that is more in line with, like, this kind of Instagram stuff or whatever, you know. Like, you have to then find something to bring to the table to capture people's attention. And, um, it's sure. the one thing that I could say that and in some way that I feel like I, I slightly understand and like on that scale, if like a hundred percent is total understanding, I'm probably going to be like maybe 10% on that. But like, I, I do see the same sort of pitfalls of like, what is popular? What is eye candy? You know, what is like emotional crack that like gets everybody super excited on stuff, you know, and like. Well, the, that goes for that goes for the, this band in general. I think I'm not very good, and this this is going to tie into how we're going to wrap this up with like ever forthright moving forward, um, what we might do in the future, the things that we consider important in music, who we are as musicians. Um, I don't say yes to everything. I don't think I ever will want to. Um, I don't know if I, I think if saying yes to everything is a requirement to be a professional musician, I don't, I don't think it's for me. Um, you know, my, I'm stubborn in that I want to play guitar really only for the purpose of playing like the licks and lines and melodies and chords that I want. Like I want to write my songs mm. um, and I want to write my, I want to put out music my way um, I want to play only the shows I want to do. Um, I don't want to really endorse products that I don't want to endorse. I, I want to do as little social media as possible. For me, for me, it's, I, I, I'm in similar in that way is that I'm, I don't think I could be a professional musician because I can't put on that working hat very well. I'm very selfish when it comes to my, when it comes to music. Um, just to chime um, in there, I think it also, it sounds like a, a matter of what your goals are. You know, if I, I think, uh, if your goal is to be, uh, you know, uh, uh, musician that can you know pay the bills from their music and from their craft and everything like that you might consider diving in you know to some of these like opportunities that are thrown your way that you might not feel super passionate about but are paying i can see you know why you could make an argument for that That's you know like point. if your goal is to like do it and do it fast you know you want to get there as soon as possible you want to get the street cred as soon as possible get a reputation as soon as possible you know so that people hear your name starts getting passed around and then maybe the goal eventually is to like okay i eventually want to like work on something solo or something like that but for the meantime i'm gonna yeah, play yeah. other people's riffs or i'm gonna sing other people's sure. songs or whatever mm -hmm. you know that's kind of my experience right there you Same. know um it's kind of like earning your stripes a little bit, but I totally get like the side of like, God damn, like I I'm tired of like singing these like really, really like, I don't know, like lame lyrics or something or like, you know, some something that was written by someone who, you know, their their English isn't their native language. And so like they're they're missing a lot or it's like just really poorly written. Um, yeah. So anyway, think of it like a business, you know, if your goal is to be, you know, one of the big big parent company businesses, you know, then just like, just make sure the projects you're taking on are high quality, you know, put out a product that you're like, okay, this like, you know, stands up to the other industry standard quality products out there, you know, fake it till you make it kind of thing. Um, 
But if you're not as worried about the timeline, you know, take your time with it, you know, refine your own songwriting skills, invest in your instrument, you know, take lessons, invest in your instrument, refine your chops and stuff. And, you know, people will eventually hear you if, you know, I mean, there's, there's a million ways, uh, you know, a million different vehicles now uh, for getting your name out there. But like, if you come out looking good, you know, your uh, the image is solid and the musicianship is there and the production is solid. You know, I, I think I would like to think that eventually you would be noticed, you know, and word of mouth, organic growth of your product will, you know, occur. No, you got that. a point, man. Yeah. It depends on your goals. It depends That's on right. your goals. I've, yeah. um, I guess I could speak to this cause I've been, you know, uh, basically the only job I've ever had is playing music. Um, so, you know, the benefits of, of just, you know, doing what you have to do for a living. I've said yes to a lot of gigs. I really didn't want to do. And I still actually do that a lot just cause this is how I pay my rent. Sure. But one, one benefit about that that people don't talk about is by saying yes to things you don't want to do. Sometimes you surprise yeah. yourself where, you know, I've mm-hmm. met some great musicians and made some great connections on gigs I didn't want to do. Yeah. Um, you know, especially in New York, where there's a lot of everybody's just trying to do everything to pay the crazy yeah, rent here. So I've made connections. Yeah, like, yeah, I've met some, you know, I've done like restaurant gigs or wedding gigs where there's just like a, you know, few monsters on the gig and that that would I would meet them through that. And that would lead to other things. I've gotten some of my best opportunities through just bizarre freak accidents, you know, covering for, um, you know, musicians because they were, you know, got injured or sick or or what have you. So, um, yeah, I mean, there there are benefits to just saying like, oh, yeah, I'm just going to do what I want to do. I I only want to be a part of uh, situations that are fulfilling creatively. But the side effect, the the downside of that is that you kind of miss out on some of those opportunities that, you know, you're just there by, by happenstance and you don't know, um, you you might not want to do it in the moment, but it leads to bigger and better things. Um, You know, but I do see the other side of it where it's like, okay, you know, you do enough of those gigs that you don't want to do. Like somebody explained it to me like this, like you have this, this creative well, and you can only tap into that so much, you know, every time you do something that's like creatively soul sucking, you take a, a pail out of the well and pour it out. And you can only do that so many times before the well runs dry. I could see that side of it. So then therefore you might want to, you know, make your money doing something else and then just be able to, you know, select what things you want to do totally. um, that that are going to be fulfilling. I see that yeah. side of it. The other, you know, sure. another side is that I've, you know, by doing those gigs that I was talking about, I've become a much better musician yeah. playing, but being in situations where I'm, I'm like the most experienced person in the band and people are looking to me as to being like, leading things you know i've been in the situation of like okay you know uh i'm i'm the only person that knows the song so i have to show people through it and people kind of lean on me as being that concrete and i've been in the situations where it's been the opposite i'm leaning on somebody else so you know those kind of experiences do do kind of yeah and you are getting those experiences that's like the kind of currency that comes with it as well yeah, being the guy where like, oh, it's okay. okay, Jared's on the gig, everything's gonna be cool. You know, there there is something to that, and that mm-hmm. comes no, totally. with experience. That's the thing, you know, like when if if you, if there's somebody there that you know you can depend on, you know, you you can literally depend on them, as if like you know there's just whatever somebody that you depend on in life. So. Yeah. Yeah. One thing I've learned, like playing with a lot of people over the years, is. Uh, um, you know, some people will go into a gig like, oh man, so, so name musician is on this gig. So I'm kind of, you know, they'll be nervous about it. And what I've discovered is that, you know, what make those guys, the, what makes those guys, you know, the top sidemen is that they actually are 
make your job easier. Like, oh, oh, like, let's say we mentioned the name Pino yeah. Palladino, right? Like, or, or somebody like that, like what, what they do that's really great is that they, they make it easy. It's like, you know, uh, uh, he's just the first name that came to mind, but like any, any like seasoned session musician, it's like the, when I first started to play with, with people that were just, you know, better and more experienced than myself, the first thing I felt wasn't that I was, I mean, there is the ass kicking element sometimes, but there's also the, you know, it's like going out to run every day with a 50 pound weight on your back and all of a sudden just taking yeah. it off. Really? You know, so that those kind of experiences do sometimes happen just from doing things you don't yeah. want to do. So anyway, I think we have three. I think we have time for one more question here. And if you have to hop at any point, anyone like while someone's talking, just, you know, do what you got to do. But um, I don't know if this this whole conversation is going to come up before or after we release a song. But I I wanted to ask the group. um like, what is the legacy of Ever Forthright moving forward? What is Ever Forthright? Would will Ever Forthright tour? Is Ever Forthright a band? A band? Is it is it a studio project? Um, what can people I, expect I, of Ever Forthright? Well, that's, I, like we said before, I still never release. officially joined the band, so <laughs> you see what happens. Now. You're gonna get your gift card. Don't worry. <laughs> yeah, I, I, Amazon gift cards on the way. <laughs> I think the the only thing that we've learned so far is that we don't know and we can't plan for anything. Any vision that we've had that we didn't execute on, like it just always changes, right? So it's it it will be whatever it is, whatever it needs yeah. to be. It could it yeah. could it could it could very well just be a studio project of a <sighs> bunch of friends. Could be anything, you know. That could, could be, anything. Anything. That's be the name of the record. Ever could... forthright, it is what it is. <laughs> Jesus. It is what it is. <laughs> <laughs> to, to, the album has been done for many months. That's the most we have still haven't told the New Yorker title. record name. I fucking just was like, yeah, it yeah. Is just what make it, it the is. most New York. Yeah, make it make it the most New York thing. Not for nothing. It is what it is. <laughs> like, so like take take taking the take the D taking the D train. It's like you have to order a physical copy uh, only the D like train no right. that's that's a real thing. Like oh, give you like just a, an empty box. You don't even get a record. And and it just says it is what it is on a handwritten note by Jared. And that's <laughs> But here's also the thing about what it is is that anytime we try to come up with anything serious we just go off on a tangent like and never actually get a point because <laughs> like up until this day the, the album has been done for months and we still cannot come up with a name yeah i was about to ask you guys you guys don't have a name yet oh no because we, we just I mean, we did that like, we just I we just go off the rails I, if someone <laughs> someone just pick one but i don't even official. care just like shit do you, do you guys have, wait do you guys have like a cell is what's the title of this the the 2011 record. First one is nothing. It's nothing. nothing. I just wanted to call it Upon Arrival. Why is that funny? That's, why don't you just call it so funny? cheesy jazz person. Yeah, why don't you just do why, why don't just, what is the, And like literally the whole artwork behind that. And Jacob's going to pick it. It's supposed to be your optimism. It's one of the sickest things. Come on. Why don't you guys just do like a self-titled? Just, just, just do the self-titled. Let's do the self-titled again. Again. Ever fourth right too. Just call it Ever fourth right again. Wait, well, wait. Which one was ever? That's not bad. You're that's that's fucking cool. The Imagine is... calling it. Wait, you should just call the record again. Yeah, that's really cool. It's... Or let's just I call like it Jacob Yumansky. He's on another record. <laughs> no, Jacob I mean, picked it. Let's call it again. I really Jacob like that. It. We're done thinking about call it again. Please just call no, it again. There's no. Please call it again. Let me let me fill you in. <laughs> ever, ever forthright. Do not come. Do not. Wait, 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 Chris. What was that thing? What was that thing? Canada, Canada, America, Mexico. Can we name it that? Because it stands for come. Oh my god. What if it was a uh, try not to come? Try yes. not to come. Oh, I'm so gonna brilliant. come. Oh my god. How about ever fourth? Like, no, oh, I'm, I'm gonna come. come right. <laughs> oh, I'm gonna come. That's all right. Funny. Jesus no, this Christ. doesn't. This well, doesn't wait, taste like this. <laughs> this does. It's gonna Are be, we? It's gonna be sticking with the original names for these songs. Yeah. I remember at some point yeah. we were yeah. kind of toying around yeah. with like different names, like more related to the lyrics, I guess. Right? Yeah. We, is that is that not a thing yeah. though? I think we went went with the no, original we're names. That, we're keeping something the just. I think the I album think we're cover. We're married to it. The yeah. album cover. Okay. Yeah, the album cover is gonna be a guy just like spitting out water. You know, like if someone like laughs really hard, they go. 
So that's the album cover. Someone just spitting out water, and then the album is called Ever Fourth Rate. This doesn't taste like cum. <laughs> oh man. <clears throat> On that. Oh my god. All right, guys, let's kick it. We've been here for two hours. Wow. Who knows? Honestly, hasn't felt like two hours. <laughs> Who knows if anyone has even? Yeah. I know. Uh, it, it was fun, though. Um, when when are you planning on publishing? Like, are you waiting till music is out? Or um, so right now, leave that up to Hawk. Uh, we don't know. So so the album artwork is in progress, and Patrick is starting the videos. But he said a few months. So oh man, yeah, we'll we'll see. But Shit, it's, it's all I there. Realize, is that long? Okay. Uh, yeah, I think he's been working okay. on music videos too much, so he said he's got to he's got to kind of tone down that a little bit. Uh, he didn't use those words; yeah. I made those words up. But... Yeah. <laughs> Canada, United States, Mexico, come. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, come again. I think is pretty hilarious. <laughs> I, I I think that is fucking great. That's good. But like, let me know though if you actually want me to rack my brain because like. There's a shitload of lyrics here that I can try and draw from. You know what I mean? <laughs> um, what is this? <laughs> wow. You. Oh you my saw God. it. You I saw mean, it. Amazing. You saw it here, folks. This is it, folks. This is br breaking news. Alive? Jared Lippy oh is. Oh my God. Oh, 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 my gift card, though. I, I think in the same card. sense, nobody else has been I in, we were just is in on the a band, call to right be honest. Now. I think Jared's oh. the only member now. Yeah. <laughs> that's a solo solo project is this ai generated oh, it, it, it's fake yeah. it's fake who's listening you in on the conversation what? it's oa generated i you know what for a small oh, nominal right. fee oh, anybody listening <laughs> you could have one of these two <laughs> Yo, that's a good this is a good thing we could sell these we you sign them too be an honorary member of ever fucking <laughs> how much money does it cost <laughs> does it mean it doesn't mean you're on the album. It just means that you're, mean you're a member of Ever Fourth Rate. It means you're going to send you a piece of paper. Yeah. <laughs> you own zero IP. <laughs> oh, man. I mean, it could be content for, like, you know, a Patreon or something. You know, sell these certificates, you know, to help fund totally. the next, you know, 2033 album Certainly for the whatever. next podcast. <laughs> <laughs> This is a cum cast. This is uh, the air before that cum cast. Well, you know, all in all, all right. seriousness, all right. you know, the the record <laughs> is is definitely something that I think people will enjoy. You know, and uh, Mike, yeah. in terms of legacy, man, you know, I think having you being a part of that legacy is something that uh, I I personally couldn't have asked for like a better person so you know I'm, I'm i'm happy that you're here you know and i think you did a fantastic job and um no for real that, man. and uh you know i as someone who's had to here here figure out themselves you know it's it's really nice to be able to like well first of all <laughs> knowing you for so long is is great and and, and it's fun too you know so it's nice to be able to I be know. like that's someone that i know but also, like you know, I can I can enjoy it as, as uh, like I can enjoy it as it is for what it is. You know what I mean? And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I appreciate uh, I'm, that for whatever yeah. it's worth, man. I'm very proud of you. So well done. Yeah, thank you, man. Now kiss yeah, like the it. And dude, until you mentioned it, I didn't even realize. Like I had forgotten. I mean, that we had met that long ago. That it's it's yeah. been a decade. A, right? a, I mean, a like long over time. Now. Over a decade. Don't even so. remember, you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that that is why. So you know. Yeah. No, but no, thank you, you know, man. Life that means is a lot. funny like that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Life is very funny, and uh, some things come full circle. You have no idea how things are going to connect or end up. You know, so that's why uh, it's just better to try to always be nice to people. And, um, but yeah, you know, but, I know. Um, like, don't hey. be a fucking asshole. I feel like that is so many people in our genre's demise. Is there I a can, fucking prick? I, I can speak you to know? that. You know, I, <laughs> I've like... had some, I've had my moments, but, um, you know, I feel lucky to be able to share these moments still with people that I consider friends and, uh, you know, still just being a part of it all yeah. and, and seeing how things get to grow. I, I actually always, I felt like I got the best seat in the house yeah. and uh, this is no exception for me. So, yeah. I got the best yeah, seat in the house that's though. That's awesome, dude. 
Yeah, likewise, man. <laughs> I like, uh, yeah, 2077, yeah, yeah, never can never come again, or, or like, all, all out of come. <laughs> all out know. of come. All out of come, uh, or like, sh- uh, shooting dust. Whoa. I don't know. <laughs>